here with Mark Dos Santos, manager of Ottawa Fury FC. Uh, Mark, tell us a little bit about your beginnings in football. Uh, what was your introduction to the beautiful game? Was it family-wise? or? Uh, it's incredible. I, I, I was blessed, you know, with, with my father. My father was, uh, he played um, not at a very high level, but still he played in the first division back then of Mozambique, where uh, it was an ex-Portuguese colony and um, it was a good league back then and after he started coaching when he arrived in Montreal um, back in the 70s he, he coached Luz Ostad of Montreal Mo Mo where it was probably in, in the years where the, the semi-pro league of Quebec was at the top after that you never had a semi-pro league like, like you had back then uh, I remember going to watch Luz Ostad of Montreal play Three, four thousand people in the McGill in the McGill Stadium, right? Um, now you don't have that at semi-pro level in Quebec. You have two hundred people, and it's a lot. And you would have the um, Corfinium, all Italian players against uh, Luso Star of Montreal, all Portuguese. Her Hermes was all Greek, so you really had that rivalry of communities. Uh, now, in the last few years, if you play for Corfinium. You could be Asian, you could be Portuguese, Canadian. Back then, no, Corfinium was full in pact of Italians. And it was very good. And, and, and that's where I got my introduction, going to training with my dad. He would put me behind the goal when they would do finishing exercise. I would run after the balls. I would go to every game. And I remember paying a lot of attention to the locker room. Uh, my father conducted himself. Our games would affect my dad you know, coming back home, the importance of winning. And all of that played in my development as a coach. My dad had this big radio where he would uh, listen to the relato. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you say it. Um, the, you know, the game in the radio. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. The, and, he, and there was this huge antenna to get Porto. And sometimes you can move. A, if you would move to right or left, you would lose the game. So you would really have to find it. And so I I grew up in that environment. And uh, after we moved, when I was young to Portugal at the age of nine, I started to play there. Um, I started to get all the culture regarding soccer. And very early, I said, hey, I want to be a coach. It's funny. I never had the dream of becoming a top player. Never. Never crossed my mind, hey, me, I want to play in the World Cup. I always wanted, me, I want to be a top coach. I want to become a very good manager. And that's how things developed. Hmm. So that's interesting. So you never had really playing aspirations of any no, kind? No, I played, you know. And in Portugal, I played for teams third division level, you know, that a lot of people would praise themselves for that. I don't, you know, for me, you get praised if you're in the I level, first division, or here the MLS, the NASL, but... You know, to play in third division, fourth division in Portugal, for me it was, I would go to school, I would play in a good club. Back then I played for Grupo Desportivo da Gafanha, uh, a club very, very close to Aveiro. Uh, I was for a while in the youth academies of Beira Mar. Uh, so th that's where I grew up as a player, an uh, okay level. But I said, I, I'm not going to be a player that's going to play for Real Madrid, Benfica, Porto. So maybe I could achieve high levels as a coach. So I started very young. I was 25 when I started to, to read uh, biographies on coaches, to read uh, stories on coaches, how they uh, gain success, to start reading on, on coaching methodology. And I was very young when I started to get, you know, sports science and all that and I think I was 26, my first internship at Boa Vista, at their mm -hmm. youth academy. And after, from, from there on, you start growing and you have a coaching license, first opportunity with the reserve team of the Montreal Impact and so on. Mm -hmm. All right, so your shift into management, uh, obviously mid-20s, you really decided to, uh, to pursue your dream of becoming a manager then? Yes, I was maybe 25, 26, but I would say 26. When I arrived at Boa Vista and I did my two weeks internship there, I said, wow, this is what I want to become. I want to be a coach at the highest level possible. And back then the coach of Boa Vista was Jaime Pacheco uh, when I did my first internship, but I was a, a fitness coach called Ricardo Pino introduced me pretty much to 
Professor Vitor Frade in Porto, Professor uh, José Guilherme Oliveira. Then I went to an internship uh, at FC Porto, and then with uh, Elid Yuval, that today is the assistant coach of the national team of Portugal. And all of that started to build that dream that, that hey, uh, more and more I want to be a coach, I want to be a coach. So uh, obviously talking about the Montreal Impact, um, what did you learn during, firstly, your first two years in charge of Trois-Rivières in the CSL, and then further, your first top-ish division job with the Impact? Yeah, my, my, what I learned in the, the attack of Trois-Rivières, the, the reserve team of the Impact, was to build the team from scratch. Uh, when I came in Ottawa and I came in this office, I, I saw myself doing a lot of the things I did at the attack of Trois-Rivières because it started from scratch. I remember being home back then. We had a small apartment. It was my first year married with, with my wife Mary in a small apartment in, in, uh, in La Chine. And I remember the table I, wa I, I was in with full of papers and names. You know, I remember names, I remember writing, the guys, the best players of the semi-pro league of Quebec, the best players of the National Training Center, uh, the best university players, and I had all of that, and I start building from zero. So I learned to build from scratch at the attack, and, 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 and to deal with my first locker room of older guys. You know, I'm, back then I'm 27, and my, my squad, uh, the average age is age is 26 so I'm like their buddies you know uh, and I have to deal with how to separate myself I have to be a manager and I, I think I, w I did a fairly good job when it comes to that because uh, I, I was able to to say you know or to show you know I'm, I'm your age but I'm, I'm the coach and there's a certain separation and respect um, so I learned a lot in that in Montreal, different. I learned how to deal with pressure. I learned how the day-to-day -day, um, winning mentality the impact has, the must-win at every day. You know, it's you win a championship. It's not. It's we won the championship October 17, 2009, and the 18th. I, I'm already talking with Nick about okay, what's our next move to win next year? Incredible experience uh, to deal with media. I love the media of Montreal but they don't know how much they give me. They don't have a clue how much they taught me, you know, to deal with different things. So, 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 so the attack was phase one, the impact was phase two, that I feel a lot of the passion and intensity I have in my blood comes from the Montreal impact. So uh, do you still have ties to your hometown club to this day? Um, good, excellent ones. Mm -hmm. With Nick, with Adam Braz, we speak on the phone. Uh, very, very good ones. But three years in Brazil now, two years in Ottawa, slowly you detach, right? It's the first girlfriend and you, 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 you leave her or, you know, you get your heart broken when you're young. And the first months are tough, but slowly, you know, you move on, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the Montreal Impact was that. But uh, I could tell you, I, I, I speak a lot with Nick DeSantis and Adam Braz. We keep an excellent, an excellent uh, communication. So moving on now to your time with Fury FC, obviously putting together a team of basically rejects and free transfers was a bit of a challenge for you. Now that you've put some distance between yourself and the 2014 season, uh, how do you feel about Fury's inaugural campaign? Uh, I wouldn't call it rejects. I, I would just call it, you know, we... We went after players that were um, wanted to, that wanted to 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 come to a project of year one. So you don't get rejects. Far from that. But you, when you're year one, you can get guys that are already under contract, and that's what we faced. We faced wow, Stephen Derude. He would be good in our squad. Yeah, he has a two-year deal with San Antonio. Oh, uh, we really like Mike Randolph. Yeah, he's in his option year with Atlanta. We faced a lot of that. So after you have to go and say, okay, then who's free? So who's free? This is the list of defenders. This is the list of, of, of midfielders. This is the list of forwards. You understand? So it's 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 pretty much who was free. Uh, when when I look at it, you have the personal mark that is I'm used to win. 
uh, we won a lot at the impact um, went to Brazil to to even Primeira Camisa it was our best um, Copa São Paulo campaign in the club's history I go to Palmeiras we're Brazilian Cup champions uh, their last uh, it's their last national title as a club um, go to the Sportivo Brazil with a very young team qualified to the last 16 of the Copa São Paulo so it's success 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 when it comes to that and after you come to Ottawa and you finish 8 out of 10 and you're a little bit hard on yourself but when you take like you said some space and you you look at building from scratch building a, a, a culture that took a lot of it to to it was faster to build a, a, an identity like you guys speak about our team and you know how we're gonna play you know what our wingers are our roles are you know it, if i play two forwards in a game you guys are all gonna be surprised so you know there's a huge identity playing wise to the club that has grown in the year what took more time to build wasn't the playing identity, was the culture in the locker room. Why? Because they all come with different cultures. They had coaches that had a dress code on Thursdays. They had a coach that didn't allow to play cards in the airport. They had a coach that you had to drink one liter of water and whatever, whatever thing comes, so much culture. And now you're saying, this is the culture of the Ottawa Fury. That took time, and not the end of the season we added. And going into this season, we know it's it's there, you know. That was difficult. But when you take space and you say, "Look, you build from scratch," you 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 were in Carlton for a lot of months, transition to TD Place, getting so many things you don't know about organized because it's new, you know. And you say, even like that. All your games, apart from Carolina, again, all your games, teams that beat us, if you go watch all the last 10 minutes of all the teams that beat us, there may be up in the score from by one goal, and they're, they're in their box defending for their lives the last five minutes. It's because every game we played, we were extremely, extremely competitive. And I see it very positive. Uh, moving forward. How much had the second division of North American soccer changed in the years you were away in Brazil? Uh, incredibly. Incredibly. It's crazy. It's. I was talking with Nick DeSantis months ago and I said, Nick, it's not the same. It, it improved a lot, you know. Back then, you didn't have, uh, like, we had the Montreal Impacts, the Vancouver Whitecaps, Portland Timbers, Seattle Sounders, all at a good level, but none as at the level of we want to promote to a, to even to a marketing uh, place we bring in Senna we bring in Raul like New York did uh, San Antonio we bring in Castillo it didn't exist back then we didn't have that we had the uh, MLS and the second division and now you have a lot of players in the NSL that could easily play in the MLS but financially now the problem is that some MLS teams are paying better. Some NASL teams are paying better MLS teams. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you an example. Freeman, maybe, uh, the right back of, of New York, his value in MLS is 60000 But he's not allowed to get housing because of rule and whatever. He belongs to the league and full of rules. And then he comes to the, NA, to the NASL, to New York Cosmos, He's not making 70, I'm shooting a number, but he belongs to the New York Cosmos, you know. And, and more and more, you have a lot of guys that could still be in squad of the MLS. And the, I don't want to be disrespectful with some MLS players, but you know some that are maybe playing in clubs that you know, some players, um, clubs that you're close or you follow more. And, and 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 you think about NASL players that are better, it happens a lot. It happens a lot. How come they keep this guy when they could get this guy from New York? It's because New York, maybe it's a better place for the player. It didn't happen back then with us. So uh, the NASL is making a big move to, to, not to compete with MLS, but to be a very 
respectful league in North America. So you come from a Portuguese background. Uh, has the Portuguese game influenced your managerial style at all? That 100%. My style of coaching is methodolo methodology of training is a lot to do with José Mourinho, University of Porto, André Villas Boas, Guilherme Oliveira, Vitor Frad, all Portuguese. That's everything related to my coaching methodology. Um, sports science, organizing macro and micro cycle, exercise and, and training as a direct influence with, uh, with, uh, with my Portuguese background. And Romualdo and Oliver are two guys that, that say this is what we did in academic or nacional, you know. So it's not surprising because it's my background. While um, my, 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 my philosophy of play, no. My philosophy of play has a little bit of everything. Um, I would say, to sum it up, what I believe in is not the Barcelona of Guardiola. I believe in the, uh, the Bayern Munich of Guardiola or the Barcelona of Bar Guardiola because that's very um, unusual. That's things that... The Barcelona of Guardiola are probably gonna, the, the team that went from 206 to 209, that three-year team, it's something unusual in the world of soccer. So you can't give that example. But I would say my, my philosophy of play has a lot of uh, Bayern Munich, uh, Rupp Heinkes, you know, a little bit of based on possession, but counter-attack counter mentality when necessary being able to adapt to both that that's where i would like to evolve one day but if you would tell me mark um if you what type of soccer would you like to play like if you could choose any that your team every day would be that I me mean, it's uh, bielsa chile of bielsa 100 percent. okay um the portuguese league is known as a breeding ground for player development um technically sound players, uh, and that's really despite a lack of funding <coughs> infrastructure. Do you think it's fair to compare what you and your coaching staff at Fury FC are trying to do to the Primeira Liga in that you're trying to compete with teams that maybe are on a bigger budget by you know, making up for that with technically and tactically sound players? Uh, I think ta what gave us success a lot of times last year was because tactically we were extremely organized and the guys embraced our idea of play. Because it's not enough for the coach to believe in something and if players don't believe. But I'll give you an example of tactically our game in Fort Lauderdale that we tied 1-1. The last game was incredible for a team that has nothing to play for in the last game. We would probably win the game if Maru doesn't get sent off. In a game that was under control... Um, you, the, the game we played in Minnesota, we lost to one, but tactically I think it was impressive. We had a lot of moments that we had a team that that was very organized tactically, and we have very good and talented talented players in the squad. But when you compete against teams that maybe financially have resources to go after the players they want. The only way you compete with that is to be, to be organized on the field. Uh, if we weren't organized, two disorganized teams, what wins is talent. Two disorganized teams, what wins is the, the team that makes a difference. And, but thank God for Costa Rica in the World Cup. Thank God for Greece when they won the Euro in Portugal. Because they showed uh, in that level that talent is important. But a level of organization in the field could give you a chance of winning. And that's, that's what we believe in and what we stick to it here. So last season you said repeatedly that you wanted to help develop players for the national team. Um, yet Benito Flores seems to be pretty uh, ignorant in a way of the NASL. Have you abandoned the goal of trying to become a feeder for the Canadian national team? I, my, I, I said it. I already answered that in another interview. My intentions when I arrived in Ottawa were a lot to help, you know, in the Canadian program. I'm, I'm not going to lie, but you can do it alone as a club. You know, maybe I wanted to push something that is done in Germany, that the Federation of Ger uh, in the Germany said, 
Bundesliga team, Bundesliga 1 and 2, these are the amount of Germans you're going to have in your squad, these are the amount of Germans that have to play, and maybe I wanted to do that alone. But if you feel that you're doing it, and, and you're not really supported, there's not a plan behind, you question, but why do we do it? Why do we do it? And after you question, but wait, wait a minute, am I here in the Ottawa Fury, but who pays my salary is the CSA? No, it's not that. So I have to give the best product to my fans. I have to give the best products to the Ottawa Fury fans. If the Ottawa Fury fans, are they going to be happy to win with all Canadians? Yes, they will. But you guys are going to be also happy if we win 2 nothing and we them and scored both. We win 2 nothing and Paulo scored both. You, the fans are going to be equal happy at the end of the day, you know. So I started to pretty much focus more on, you know, let me be concerned on the Ottawa Fury being the best team possible in the, the team. And if the best players from Pakistan, China, Indonesia, Canada, well, you know, we'll, we'll figure that out after. So you've been around the beautiful game for quite some time and have been influenced by many different coaches, teams, and styles. Um, how close would you say you are right now, let's say at the end of 2014 with the Fury team, to your ideal style of play? Uh, I'm thinking about players I have in the squad. I'm one, two. Um, three, four players of way of maximizing really some of my ideas of play. Like, I'll give you one example. One of our ideas of play is that the field is here. This is the central line, right? When, when, when we're, we're attacking and we lose possession, the first ball we lose we want to be very aggressive to recover as high as we can on the field. We have like a three-second rule. If we can recover that ball in three seconds, where we have to reorganize in our line of pressure that is close to the midfield, and that's where our block is. I feel that those three-second rules, last year, we had a lot of slow pieces in the team that didn't allow us to, like, that three-second rule from zero to ten, we were two and a half. That's how hard I'm being, two and a half. I think that with the players we have today, we could go to a five. But we're still maybe, I would say, three pieces away of getting to an eight that were very aggressive when we lost that, that first ball. And that's one of the examples of what I feel we could get better. But you have to understand that you don't better the team from year one to year two uh, at 100%. You better it, and we better it in a lot of places, but you're still going to have positions where you're only going to be able to, to extremely better it in year three, you understand? But already if you have, let's say in year one you have three good players, Year two, now you have six. Year three, you have two, nine. Example, you know. So, you've been involved with the game on uh, three different continents. How can you take ideas and football and culture from places like Brazil and Portugal and apply it here, where football isn't necessarily the number one sport and where the skill level might not be as high? Uh, I think you get all of your ideas of... <laughs> those countries give you all your ideas of playing, of training, of coaching methodology, um, contacts, I, you know, I got a lot of ideas, I don't even know where to start from Portugal and from Brazil, but I think all the package, you know, look like going with a basket that is empty and you go to Port Portugal, give me all my training me methodology. The, the, the way I think training today and I organize training and I think I have a certain reputation with players if you talk about players, they're going to mention you a lot of, with the organization of training. All about, all in Portugal. I didn't get anything from that in Brazil. It's actually very, very poor in Brazil. And that's why they, they go through a very big crisis. They live of talent. Brazil lives of talent, but they can organize that talent. And there's no way Brazil loses with a 
with Mourinho, with Guardiola, they don't lose 7-1 to Germany. They could lose 1-0, 2-1, not 7-1. No way. In Brazil, what I got was the passion. Brazil is in another planet when it comes to foot. Brazil is football. Brazil is football. And Portugal doesn't know. Italy doesn't know. England thinks they know the passion. They don't know. And I'm telling you from a guy that lived there and worked there, Brazil is passion. Brazil. I had pressure to win at the U15 level. I had fans like, I'm never going to forget when we won the Cup of Brazil, First, there were fans that thought that I would have to take Scolari place because they're so passionate. You know, day one, Scolari is doing shit. Bring the U15 coach up. That's how passionate they are. But when we won, Globe, is, uh, Globe Sport put the article on uh, Globe Sport, you know, like they do with major, yeah. like Copa São Paulo in major competitions. And there was the title, uh, Palmeiras Campeão Copa do Brasil Sub-15. There was 250,000 likes, likes, you know, on the article. And I remember looking at that with my wife and getting Facebook messages from fans of Palmeiras. And I said, it's only in Brazil. You win a U15 in the States or, or in Port even Portugal. And again, I think it was the hardest. Uh, the, the, the youth championships in Brazil are the hardest in the world. So if, you, if you're a youth champion in Spain, infantile or juvenile yeah. or junior, it's good. But in Brazil, it's the, the maximum. Because Brazil, Spain, you have four teams that compete in that. Portugal, the final four is Benfica, Sporting, uh, Porto and Guimarães or Bra Braga. Po Brazil, you have the final 20 in Sao Paulo. Santos, Corinthians, Palmeiras, Fluminense, Flamengo, Botafogo, Vasco, Grêmio, Cruzeiro. All the 20 can win the title. So winning in Brazil, even at the youth level, means a lot. So I learned in Brazil about the passion, you know. I was, I was talking with a guy from MLS that watched the Copa São Paulo final. It's the U20 level because there's a lot of scouts, you know. Chelsea's there, Benfica's there. It's the best U20 players of Brazil. And he said, wow, it's incredible. The final was Botafogo against Corinthians. Corinthians won. And he said, 36,000 people. And I go, it gives you the idea of the final of the U15 was 6,000. Still, you're talking 6,000 for many. That's not a big m uh, number. Tell me one country in the world that has 6,000 people in a 6,000-seated stadium for uh, that's San Antonio. San Antonio played the final against Fort Lauderdale. It was that atmosphere for a U15 final. And in Brazil, I learned that. Brazil was like, as soon as uh, somebody asked me, Mark, soccer, Mark, football, I answer Brazil. Brazil, it's, it's, it's passion, it's, it's crazy, it's religious, it's, it's everything. So... Question about, you know, international football now. How far away do you think we are from seeing a North American, most likely American, World Cup champion? American World Cup so, champion? So a U.S. US winning the World Cup. How far away from that are we? Oh. I don't know if they're ever going to be a U.S. champion. Is it the culture, do you think? 100%. It's only about culture. Um... Paulo is there, right? And he's been training hard and all that. I went to see him downstairs because some guys are training. I go, you enjoy it? Everything is going well? Yeah, Becky's taking care of me. And, you know, guys are great. I'm very happy. But coach, what? I go, Feijão. No, I Feijão. And you understood? And, uh, yeah, you're in Canada. You know it's tough. Culture. You can't take culture away from somebody. It's always going to be. A, a, it's your uh, roots. And so it's tough to build it. It's tough to teach a kid to, hey, when you get a little knock, maybe you could fall and you're going to win the foul that gives you. They say, oh, you cheat. It's not fair play. North America is still, I get pushed in the box, but I'm going to try to stand and shoot even with no angle 
What, what's the difference in that? When it's 0-0 zero, zero against Costa Rica or Mexico, the Mexican at the 89th is going to know how to win a foul. When Mexicans are up in the score and they walk to go get the ball, and that's all cultural. You're going to tell me it's unfair, it's not, it's not right. No, it's, it's the game, it's culture. And it's tough to teach culture. Mexicans, Brazilians, Argentinians, Costa Ricans, they learn it by watching so many games on TV. Look, we have a, player, a, a problem in North America. <clears throat> and that's something, you know, you can't really take away, but some of our guys have that. You know, you, the, we end the game away and we're back in the plane and there's the NFL and uh, they play fantasy football. Right? Between each other. And they have fun. It's okay to act like another sport. That's the difference there. The Mexican, there's no fantasy football. The Mexican, it's fantasy La Liga. You know, fantasy this. They're always, always in soccer. So the moments that are key, the moments that are key, it's going to show. It's going to show. The, it, they're going to win the foul. They're going to win that free kick. They want to win that PK. They're going to have that... Uh, um, creativity moment because their life is is that well the other one fantasy football might not understand it so maybe i'm wrong i think the world cups are always going to be for y you could ask the same question to finland how far are we to have uh, finland winning the the olympic gold medal in hockey or norway to win they might tell you never i, I don't know maybe i'm wrong I, U.S. reaching the U.S. The, the semifinal, yes. U.S. reaching the quarterfinals, yes. U.S. being incredibly competitive, yes. But in that key moment, in that key moment, I think that the South Americans, the Europeans are going to... Yeah, and I think of an example of that when Canada was playing Colombia and James Rodriguez took that quick free kick. No Canadians in that's, front of the ball. I, I mentioned that. That's 100% cultural. And I, I was talking, it's good you said that, with staff and all that. I said, if it was Canada, oh, this is a good free kick set up. Let the opponent set up the wall. But at the end, you're going to say, oh, we only lost one nothing from, of, against Colombia. But we lost. And we lost because of two kids, Ramis and Quintero, that did that in the street. That's how they played it. They did that free kick like they were in the street. And at the end of the day, that's culture. So uh, you're a fairly religious man coming from a Portuguese, I'm assuming, Catholic background. Uh -huh. uh, do you believe that spirituality can play a key role in a team's success? I'm, uh, I'm Christian, so I don't come. It's not a Christian. Yeah, but it's from a Baptist background. And I, 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 I think 100% that your success as a person is directly involved with your, your faithfulness and, and belief. And, you know, sometimes I don't want to get misinterpreted here saying that, oh, you have to be religious or you have to, to, tr to believe in Jesus or trust Jesus and everything. Not that. I respect that everybody has their own beliefs. But me, for me, this is very personal and people could agree or not. The Bible had, uh, it are my roots. The Bible are my roots of of the way I live and conduct myself. And I'm far from being perfect. And that's why I thank God for the word because it, 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 it helps me on my, all of my not perfect ways, you know. But uh, one of the, 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 the biggest thought that I see in the big man of the Bible is that to, be, uh, to have integrity and be your best all the time. And I'll give you an example of that. This is a story that I, I talk about it in a lot of, uh, a lot of and motivational speeches. Is I arrived in in Primera Camisa from Montreal. So I, I'm five years in Montreal, media, fame, uh, going to a restaurant in Montreal. This is paid for, people knowing you all over the place and autographs. And then I arrive at Primera Camisa, U20. Um, the jerseys were wet, white and red, but th the training jerseys were so washed that it was uh, white and pink. Um, 
the, the, where we slept was was old. I, I had uh, hands going up my neck when I was sleeping, very hot, 40 degrees in San Jose. And I came to the first training, the bus leaves in, uh, us in our first training. I arrive and I see the equipment manager putting the net in the goals because there was no net. No lines on the field, no white lines. And I'm putting the cones and the cones, uh, the grass was like that more or less. So I didn't say a word. And what I see, real story, I see a horse because it was in the middle of like a, with trees. And I see a horse passing from the one side of the field to the other and going in the... So I have two things there. I could bitch. Yeah, I was in Montreal, this, that. I, I have market in the U.S. I don't need this. But I'm going to tell you one thing. And because of my roots with the Bible and I think what God's word and what he put in my heart was always be faithful and do the best you can wherever you are. I give every single training session like if I was at Real Madrid. I never bitched. I put my all for the players. And the result, one of the worst teams in their history on paper, best result in the Copa São Paulo, Cinderella story. We end up getting knocked out by Corinthians that won the Copa São Paulo. Center back of Corinthians was Marquinhos in 2000. So it was a different level. But the thing here is, when we won the Copa of, uh, Cop of Brazil in PKs, I cried. And the, the, the last PK, Souza, a kid called Souza took it, center back. I was scared of him taking it. I remember asking if we need a six who wants to go. I didn't have a, a paper, and I don't want to, to say you have to go. I never do that because players might go and they're not good mentally. And I go, if we need a six, who's going to go? I had to give the list to the ref. And so the says, coach. And me, I looked at him, and in my head, I go, oh, no. But, you know, okay. He puts it in the top corner, you know, very well striked ball, boom, in the corner, big celebration. I cried, and the first thing that comes into my head was because you were faithful in that Primera Camisa when the grass was like that, you never bitch, you know, this is the prize I'm giving you. And I lived my life like that, that sometimes we go through things that are very difficult, and I tell my players, integrity, character, Give your all, all the, every day. Don't lie to yourself. And then you're going to see doors opening. So I think that that spiritual side helps a lot in success, 100%. So uh, it's a family affair for Fury FC and the Youth Academy with your brother Philip, currently the director of the academy. What is the club's long-term goal in fielding a pair of youth sides in the Quebec League? A pair of youth sides? We have 20, already, U18, right? Yeah. We already have mm -hmm. now our two. But now they're teams. competing in Quebec, so what's, yeah. what's the goal of that? The goal of that is to give them the best competition p possible inside our financial reality. We could have played on, in Ontario, but 80% of the games are in Toronto. Uh, it's all, okay, Phil, f first of all, we hired Phil, and I said it a lot of, Phil is the best one we could get in Canada for, for this job, by far. It's not even about being my brother. It's by far, far the most competent person to do this job. And afterwards, we said, now we have these kids. We're going to focus on giving these two groups the highest level of competition possible, training five times a week in a great environment. And um, where can we play? Where can it be the most day in, day out, the best competition? And Quebec opened us that door. And that's an incredible move also from Ontario allowing that and Quebec allowing that because it benefits not Ontario. We have to stop with benefiting the old guy, 80 years old, that is in work in Quebec against Ontario and politics in Canada that are incredible. What's the best for the player? And today, the best for the player, in our case, is he's going to play against uh, Laker, Lakeshore, he's going to play against Longueuil, he's going to play against uh, Blainville, every, year, every day playing against the best players on that side, competing at the best level, three players are going to move to the first team, always to train with the first team, we're trying to make this with the resources that we have, the best place to be for, for a player in, in Ottawa. And so you talk about, you know, acting and working within your financial restraints, 
How key do you think it is, and how soon do you think it'll be before we start seeing academy players in the first team? I'm, uh, you know, it's expensive housing for us. So bringing players from outside all the time, it's not fun. You understand? We, we need local guys 100%. Like, look at San Antonio, how lucky they are that uh, Castillo's son is, uh, is studying in San Antonio. So he decided to show up at the club. Hey, you know, I, I was one of the best players in the first division of Colombia. My kid is here. You know, maybe I could play here. You know, how lucky do, are you that you're in a market because of Mexico and Texas, whatever. You need to develop this somehow. And uh, you, to answer your question is how long? I, w I wish tomorrow we have a player from, from our academy. So I don't know the years it's going to take. I'm telling you that with the resources we have, we're already doing... You should take your, 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 your stuff and go to our academy to see uh, how well they're working. You, you, you should do a work in our academy. How um, drastically it changed. Uh, years ago, you had parents on the field. It looked like a summer camp. Today, the parents, the parents are outside. Only coaches and players get in five times a week. They're going to start playing in the best environment possible in our reality. I think it's fantastic, the move that Philip and Darko did. And Philip has a lot of... He's not praised enough for what he does in the club. And so, lastly, we'll go away from the pitch. Outside of football, what do you enjoy? Family, food, hobbies, etc. Wine. I enjoy wine. wine. Me and my wife were, were very good. I enjoy Mary. Mary's my life. Uh, my wife has is, is been so incredibly supportive. And I'm going to write a biography one day. I know I will. And I want to write it for... Um, for, for young coaches that start and have aspirations, it's a dream of mine, you know? And how important it is for any young coach to choose the right partner. Or you're single to do this job, or you have the right partner. My wife always has the luggage ready, and if we have to move to Dubai, let's go. Oh, we have an offer in Ethiopia, let's go. You're the national team of Ethiopia, coach. Who gives? I'm with you. And, you know, twins and so many wives today. No, no, the twins are in school. I have twins and a daughter. So we have a gang when we move, you know. We move as, as like the gremlins. You know when they got out of the, of the pool, you know. All of them. <laughs> We're like that, man. And, and she's, let's go. Let's go. The door open. You feel it's good for our career. She's, so my life I'm outside soccer. Did you say where to meet you? My wife, my kids. I enjoy good food. I enjoy a glass of wine. That's why I have to run in the gym because I, I enjoy, I enjoy, I enjoy a table with wine and, and food and family and being there for hours and enjoying those times. I, I enjoy it a lot. Yesterday I watched The Bachelor with my wife, so it gives you an idea. <laughs> there you go. And yeah. uh, on the pitch, 2015 and beyond. I mean, both for Fury FC and for you personally. What are your goals? Uh, we want to make the playoffs. You know, it's we we like we see Tampa, New York, and Minnesota at a maybe player wise, uh, financially wise, at a different level. But we say it's four spots, you know. And uh, our our goal to make it simple are clearly to make the playoffs.